We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Mind Mate podcast. And we have Gary Latterman with us today. And uh, I think as I'll explain, and, and I, as I already have explained in the intro, um, I do the intros after the show, Gary, just so just so you know. Um, uh, Gary, I heard, I heard Gary on the Joe Rogan podcast and any kind of conversation that moves into the realm of psychedelics and religion and just kind of how we're all, how we're all thinking about these very, very old, uh, profound ideas really, really grips me. So Gary, thank you so much for joining me today, mate. Hey, I'm, I'm glad we can finally arrange it. And, um, like I said, I'm looking forward to having a chance to talk with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good. It's it's always fun when you're arranging the times from someone uh, on the other side of the world. You have to go back and forth a bit, but um, it only builds rapport and adds to the value of the relationship. I think. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah, I hope to get to Australia sometime. Believe me. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be fantastic. That'd be cool. Um, sure. Yeah. So for everyone just listening and tuning in uh, for the first time, why don't you give the uh, the listeners a bit of an introduction as to who you are and what you do? Oh, well, I, um, um, who I am, um, I'm, um, uh, I teach, uh, at Emory university, um, and I have written a few books and, um, have been involved in various projects. Um, mostly what I try to do is, uh, to stay sane as much as I can. Good. <laughs> um, but uh, beyond that, um, you know, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I, I teach I teach a variety of classes like death and dying, um, religion and sexuality, uh, sacred drugs, religion and health. Um, um, uh, my area of, of of training is really in American religious history and and religious studies a little more broadly. Um, but uh, you know, as I said, I've, I've written a few books on death. Um, I've started up a couple of uh, um, sort of public scholarship based um, media enterprises. One was called Religion Dispatches, which uh, was a part of a group that got that going. And then uh, more recently, this um, religion website, uh, Sacred Matters. Mm. And on that, I've started a, 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 I followed in your footsteps. I've, I've started a podcast that's oh, cool. called Sacrili- Sacrilegious. Cool. Um, so that we're just starting. And yeah, I mean, I like to, as much as possible, kind of get involved in a lot of different uh, various things. Yeah, that's so cool. Now, there's so many things honestly, that I want to discuss with you. And I can't wait to get to sexuality and dying and some of the more uh, sacred um, drugs. But the first question I, I, I was actually thinking that I wanted to ask you was that there seems to be a, a movement going on in the world, um, especially in Western cultures, where people say that they're, they're not religious, but they're very spiritual. Now, when you're teaching religion, do, how, how does that kind of come about that idea that people are, are, are more or less interested in spirituality, um, but they're moving away from religion. Does that kind of change how you teach religion or what, what's your kind of um, take on that? It is, as you say, a real um, important and significant cultural trend uh, over the last couple decades to make that distinction. And just the, for me, the very kind of short answer is, it's a, a kind of institution versus personal experience. So mm-hmm. religion, just for many people, brings to mind religious institutions and traditions and constrictions and, you know, kind of control and a, uh, I, I'm going on and on a bit here, but, you know, kind of emptiness, mm-hmm. whereas the spiritual is tied into some more personal, uh, meaningful, uh, subjective experiences that, that 
well, quite frankly, have more value mm -hmm. than uh, what you people are getting from institutions. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's always been a fascinating one for me, uh, because, you know, I was raised a Catholic and, you know, you learn about original sin and you learn about eternal suffering and all these kinds of, I suppose when you, when you read them at face value, uh, they sound like indoctrinations and, you know, and they sound terribly frightening, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've been so interested in the psychological context of these ideas, you know, of moving from a bad place to a good place from heaven to hell and all these kinds of ideas. Um, because it, it, it took me a long time. And I, I know I'm not the only one out there to kind of transcend, you know, that Catholic guilt. Um, it actually grouped me to the form of an obsessive compulsive disorder, to be completely honest. Um, it went pretty Religion crazy. can do that too. Uh, you know, believe me in, in terms of psychology. Yeah. 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 It, it's just so, uh, it, we live at such an, we live in such an interesting time because we, you know, we can through this media, we can start to have these conversations. Like what, what do you feel like Jesus actually meant here? How, how does that compare, you know, but to what Muhammad, Muhammad was talking about and we can look at what the Buddha was doing. So when you're, when you're teaching religion, Take us kind of a run through with that. Do you do you take upon all these different examples from different religions? Um, is it comparative mythology? Yeah. Well, yeah. What's it look like? For me, I um, well, I, you know, I could, I could break it down uh, in general and in a lot of ways, at least, especially for the death and dying and the yeah. religion and sexuality class. It's a very, very much um, tied into you know three different elements that I try to cover. So one um, has more of an anthropological cross-cultural focus where we try to look at death or sexuality and Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism and the West and the, you know, uh, Near East, whatever. Just and, and of course, you can only do that superficially, and I'm not an expert in all of those areas, um, but we try to kind of with right now I'm talking about students, you know, with sure. their appetites. The second um, section in both of those classes look more specifically at the history of Christianity mm. um, in terms of death and in terms of sexuality. Uh, that is, is, as I said, more historical, looks at more cultural and social dynamics and the various ways in which um, Christians understand both death and sex. Mm. Um that is not just how they change through time, but how at any particular time there are multiple <laughs> views and practices that, uh, you know, don't allow for any kind of great generalizations, I think, mm. um, about uh, in either case. And then the last section generally looks at America and tries to look at both of those topics. You know, I feel like the Christianity part uh, lays the groundwork for a greater sense of what's happening in America, even though there's obviously much more going on than just uh, Christian issues uh, and forces in um, um, the history of America around religion and death or religion and sexuality. Mm, mm. Yeah, because yeah, sexuality is an interesting one. It's, as far as I know, it's uh, it's only kind of one parable or story in the Bible that you know, referred to, well, at least homosexuality. And it was, is that Sodom and Gomorrah uh, story, but I don't know too much about it. How does that kind of come into it? Let's, let's, let's uh, open Pandora's box and talk about sexuality then. <laughs> well, I mean, there's uh, a lot to say and there are a lot of mm. different directions to go. And there are a lot of conflicting narratives and, and stories around sexuality in every religious tradition, mm -hmm. you know, whether mm -hmm. you're talking about the Hebrew Bible or the new Testament, or, you know, thinking about Islamic traditions and yeah. um, Buddhism. I mean, uh, it's, it is a can of worms, but it's also, you know, what one of the most basic fundamental aspects of what it means to be human. I mean, mm -hmm. when I talk about sexuality, I'd like to make sure students are aware we're not just talking about intercourse, uh, it, but yeah. sexuality is this umbrella term that gets into questions around family, gender, re reproduction, you know, all kinds of issues. And mm -hmm. uh, again, there's just so much going on in all of these different traditions that, that I think um, from where I'm coming from, which is, um, you know, whatever, not any particular faith tradition, but is from liberal arts kind of uh, 
uh, general uh, intellectual scholarly pursuit position mm. want to get them out of what is most familiar to them um, and some of these topics that I try to focus on are just you know for 18 to 22 year olds or prime time you know it's what they want to talk about yeah which is so cool because you know historically they've probably been the most contentious topics you know don't talk about politics and religion (laughs) and death is something that you know it's totally inevitable and it's the only true thing that's going to happen but we're not allowed to talk about because it's scary and all that kind of stuff so it's a perfect it's a perfect mix that you've got going on yeah i mean i'm again i'm i feel like i've tapped into something for sure my class i hate to whatever, you know, the sacred drugs class that I'm teaching in the fall has got over 300 students. Wow. You know, which is uh, uh, whatever that may mean, you know, in that <laughs> in a larger scheme of things, I, for me, you know, personally, it's, it's just great to feel a sense of, you know, uh, uh, connecting with students in a way that I think allows them to think, what do I want to say, more freely mm. you know, about topics that are so um core and mm-hmm. fundamental where it's not you know i got to talk about this with my parents or i'm supposed to talk about this with the priest or the rabbi or um you know whether they might be in private religious schools uh but generally they don't have a kind of intellectual space to just be ex- you know be exposed to a variety of different positions on sexuality mm-hmm. or death or drugs um and to be able to, again, to think in, a, in a, a more uninhibited way, even though hopefully somewhat rigorous, you know, in terms yeah. of, again, a kind of, um, where this is a classroom, what I do, at least, again, I'm talking specifically about the classroom. Well, I just don't think, I mean, you know, I'm one of the, one of the best and worst things about uh, doing a podcast, as, as obviously you know now, is... Um, you get people on the show that you really want to talk to <laughs> and it's fantastic because you guys just go for hours, but you start building these incredible little echo chambers and it's very hard to get, get outside your own head. But I I'm so in your corner. I just, I don't think there could be a better school of thought than, than talking about what's, what's going to happen to us at the, at the end when it's all said and done. The, the most important thing that we need to reconcile with the, the thing that makes us all equal straight away is our right. mortality. Perfect way to start um, free thinking when you go to university. The second thing is the most biological thing is reproduction, getting, you know, understanding the self and understanding the collective. And then in terms of religion or the broader aspect of how to find meaning in life, I just think you've tapped into the three most important Subjects. So yeah, well, hey, credit, credit to you, mate. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, but um, yeah, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. There are others who are obviously um, all kinds of great stuff being done around these topics. And mm. what I feel fortunate about is I've kind of been able to build this into um, my uh, uh, teaching routine so that, you know, incredibly, I've had here at Emory University, I've had this. Um, uh, freedom to uh, kind of build up my own courses and then offer them as I see fit. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm, I've got this great uh, um, uh, kind of uh, 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 selection of, of courses that, again, I think students like. I'm also known as a very easy professor. As I, I have to admit that too. I won't <laughs> back down from that. I wrote this piece and uh, this, I, I don't know who reads it, but it's called the Chronicle of Higher Education. And um, a lot of uh, whatever academics read it. And it's called Why I'm Easy <laughs> on Giving Lots of A's. And I give a lot of freaking A's. I mean, you know, I sure. do. I, I mean, I, especially in big classes, because obviously I'm not reading all those papers. But, um, you know, I have some other objectives and goals in the class like uh, death and dying. Mm. Then, you know, measuring, you know, having some form of assessment that's based on some quantitative, uh, you know, yes. oh, purely quantitative uh, dimension. I think there's more going on for students that I just want to appreciate and say, man, you're here. Just mm. think about these things and, you know, forget about the freaking A or B yeah. or whatever. Well, I mean, you know, the humanities and, as you said, you know, liberal arts, you know, these areas I, I'm, I'm assuming it's so much more important 
to value this subjective experience. You know, I suppose with a mathematics class, it's like, you know, did you get the answer? Was it two or did you put three down? It's like, okay, well then, you know, you don't know the value of X, so you got it wrong. But with dying and religion and meaning and, and all these things that are so personal, and you know, the way we started the podcast was talking about, you know, how the movement now in our culture is, uh, you know, spirituality as opposed to institutionalized religion. I suppose, and correct me if I'm wrong, that what you're looking for is students are thinking. They're really trying to think outside the box and have a look about how all this stuff uh, applies to their situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's uh, I'm, I'm I'm in a great place, and uh, in terms of you know my where I teach and and these students uh, are superb, um, but many I won't overgeneralize, but many are definitely kind of um, like so many students pre-professional they're on a very kind of um clear track that is tied more toward long-term career issues than being here now <laughs> you know being in the moment <laughs> yeah and so i like to put the brakes on that and say fuck all that um you know we uh, are here to read about um you know, uh, people who take mushrooms or yeah, so cool. what it's like near the end of life or what it means, you know, to think about celibacy or something. I mean, mm-hmm. all these things that are tied to, the, again, sort of core social issues. I mean, whether you, you're, you're going to look at this from a psychological point of view, a lot of this is tied into um, kind of social realities. Mm. Uh, as well and so uh, to allow them to step back from their own personal experiences or what they believe or think about for themselves and to sort of say wow this is you know um, really a force in human history and how well the politics of the present that mm. the, uh, you know again if I can contribute to that that's cool yeah yeah absolutely it's uh it's difficult when you, when you talk to people who might have a certain um, political leaning uh, that, you know, taking on a more spiritual uh, side to politics or just, you know, and because there's, there's so much baggage with the word spirituality because people, you know, and, you know, for, for better or worse or rightly so, immediately start to think that you want um, religion, you know, and you're, you're against secularism. And, you know, that's it's difficult to have that conversation. It's like, I'm not talking about religion. We're talking about the individual individual experience and how that relates. Um, but uh, there's so much baggage there. So I think it's such a perfect um, just area because, I mean, what is a university or a college other than engaging in a, in a war of ideas? you know, letting the right. ideas battle it out. And um, I suppose, you know, one thing that I was thinking about when I was listening to you on Joe Rogan was um, how, what, what's the, what's the, the student situation like to, to get these incredible discussions going. A lot of these conversations from the sounds of things would um, conflict in a good way with a lot of these kids upbringings. They're not kids, they're obviously adults. Um, how does that kind of come about? What's the interplay there? Uh, it's interesting and it's, uh, dynamic and it's changed over the years. I've been doing this for way, well, I don't know what way too long is anymore, but a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so gosh, you know, it's just so weird and, and things have changed. Mm. Um, mm. and, uh, and yet actually, as I'm just thinking off the cuff with you here, maybe that hasn't changed so much. I mean, there is a kind of dynamic of when you have these young adults, whatever you call them, late teen or, you know, late teenagers, young adults. I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're at such as we know that age. Um, you're probably, you're a lot closer than I am to it. Um, <laughs> I'm 28. So I'm, uh, but psychologically yeah, yeah. I'm still right in there. <laughs> Well, right. Yes, indeed. Um, but it's still, you know, there's so much that's, that's going on and there, there's so much, um, to, to think about. Um, so, you know, these, these are the kinds of topics that let me, um, you know, begin to explore those, those questions with them again, in ways that they have, I don't think in most, in many cases ha- haven't been able to over the course of their education or their yeah. life. So, um, and, um, what I think happens, I'm, I'm probably overstating it, but I think for in some, in many cases, you know, there is a thought or a kind of questioning of, well, maybe I can major in 
religious studies mm-hmm. or I can minor in it. And, you know, those kinds of conversations with parents, I think, have been going on for some time with my students where, you know, it's a very different way of thinking about religion than their parents are yeah. aware of. And, um, but again, I, I hope, and that's me, other, other of my colleagues in, in the department and wherever are able to kind of uh, give a sense of the relevancy of this topic to, you know, whatever your future trajectory is, law, health, medicine, business, you know, I really push, try to push those connections, but, mm. you know, I mean, I, 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 um, I, I, I think whatever, I feel uh, like I'm engaged in this more scholarly enterprise that I can introduce students to that again, they, they aren't um, able to immediately, you know, connect it with what their parents understand about religion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, these, these topics, permeate all of of culture and you know to your point you know it doesn't matter where you go whether it's law or business or whatever you want to do if you if you learn not only how you relate and reconcile with these fundamental ideas you know how to find meaning and how how you are got i suppose it comes back to meaning, doesn't it how 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 you're going to live knowing that there will be a time where you close your eyes forever um if you can reconcile that within yourself uh there's going to be a hell of a lot more a you know need for external validation all that kind of stuff but also you can relate to people because it's the only thing i think that we we all have in common apart from perhaps you know you could make an argument for sexuality we all have certain drives maybe there are some asexual people out there as well but that death thing. It's the, it's the one thing that brings us all close together. I can't, um, I can't seem to get away from that. And I think, uh, with what you spoke about in terms of religion before, you know, my, um, my experience was, was raised a Catholic developed obsessive compulsive disorder. I can't blame that on anyone in particular, obviously, but, um, became a, became a fundamental atheist and fell in love with Christopher Hitchens and, and, and Dawkins and Sam Harris. Yeah, it's just brilliant. And then, uh, there was that little, that hole of like, well, how do, who do, who am I in this world? And then when I found Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung and these comparative mythologists, uh, that's, that's when my life changed. And I was able to take a step back and look at what these things are, what these big institutions are. And um, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that's probably a similar story for a lot of people. Oh, I'm not, I have no doubt. I mean, I, I, I have no doubt that 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 those particulars too are 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 not uncommon. And um, getting out of some very strong atheist position and uh, finding some of these, uh, quite frankly, old school uh, psychologists who yeah. have a very different and more spiritual take on um, some of the deep issues around the psyche and so on. Um, so, so I think that's, uh, as you say, something that's not that, that people do experience to, mm. to some, to some degree. So what was your experience then into it, Gary? Because, uh, as you said, you've been doing this long before, uh, now, and I think now it's becoming kind of cool, <laughs> but I'm assuming you were doing it long before it was cool. So, you know, what draws someone into, uh, you know, death and dying and religion and, and yeah. Oh boy. Well, that's, uh, I, I, to be honest, I write about that in my, in this little, um, uh, memoir I have, uh, yeah. don't think about death, uh, that <laughs> that's good. answers that question. Cause I get that. I've gotten that uh, basically my whole career because yeah. my whole career has been centered on death and religion. And so I've been ambivalent about that, but I think as I've gotten older, you know, it's like, you know, finally embracing it, learning to live with it. I'm the death guy um, death with the hopes that there are other death guys <laughs> and gals and other people uh, who are so-called experts who can talk about death. But, you know, I mean, uh, boy, you know, I don't know where to begin, but certainly as a student, as an undergraduate, I was a psychology major as well. Mm, cool. Very much um, in the kind of stuff you were talking about, mm. more of the humanistic, existential, kind of coming out of psychoanalytical yeah. schools of psychology was very, very taken with that when I, when I started taking school seriously. Mm. Um, 
as a young undergraduate. Uh, but, you know, so that that got me thinking and I was immediately, for reasons, uh, again, that may uh, require another um, six hours of conversation here. <laughs> we got time. If you got time, Gary. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, you know, that I, I kind of got fixated on death. Mm. It's like, if you're going to study psychology, like, what else are you going to look at? Yeah. I and, totally and agree. As I was beginning to grow more interested in religion as a topic, it was like, well, yeah, this is where it all begins and ends, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So were you raised uh, within, a, within a particular religion at all? I was, way, yeah, I was raised as in, in basically reformed Jewish household. So I was bar mitzvahed oh, okay. as cool. well. Yep. So my, my early years up till 13 were very much, uh, well, I wouldn't say very much, but were uh, in, in some ways connected to uh, our synagogue. Mm-hmm. Then I had my bar mitzvah, you, you know, which is, this is rite of passage when you become a man. And so after my bar mitzvah, I never looked back and never went back <laughs> to the synagogue. Sure. I was never interested and took off. Yeah. So yeah. I had other interests. And, and so that more formal um, institutional kind of religion um, was lost as soon as I, I wasn't quite a man at 13, but I was <laughs> Plus, pretending to be something like uh, <laughs> a not a kid. Yeah. So, so what, what brought you back to religion then, I suppose, is the question. Oh boy. Uh, I don't know. You know, there's lots, um, you know, but to maybe get to a topic we'll get to certainly tripping, you know, having some yeah. LSD as a, as a, um, this was not in college, but it was it was something that I had, had done early in high school mm. um, or sort of late in high school. But that uh, was certainly a key that and, and mushrooms for sure as a younger man were, were in, instrumental in some ways and getting me to. Um, I don't know how to put it. Um, I guess less in- interested in a more conventional path of career yeah. and yeah. started thinking more about ideas, but without question, a, a key pivotal uh, moment uh, in my life was meeting the woman who became my wife, mm. who really uh, also just, you know, was um, instrumental in this sort of turn towards a more, um, yeah, uh, uh, I don't want to say intellectual, but the life of ideas as yes. opposed to thinking about, oh God, you know, I've got to continue to work in the record store, <laughs> which is where I used to work. No, that's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, records are making a comeback as well, mate. God, I mean, oh, you, you, Mr. Death is also Mr. Cool. <laughs> uh, boy, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, um, you know, Mushrooms did it for me as well. Um, you know, taking back to that place of uh, sentience, prior to conditioning. It's, there's just so many questions there, you know, and um, it was the most terrifying exhilarating experience <laughs> of my life. But, uh, it, you know, you draw on a lot of similarities with your experiences, the same as uh, Ram Dass's, you know, he psych psychology degree and was teaching yes. psychology and behavioralism. And it was very much a, about uh, Freudianism and um, looking at the similarities in the animal world and, and then the human world. I suppose when he was doing it and then he started tripping out with Terence McKenna. And I think his experience was fascinating because he was, he was constantly trying to get turned on. I think, as he says in be here now. Um, and, and he would always find that no matter how high he got, uh, he, he eventually had to come back down. And as soon as he went to India and he met his guru, he, the way he describes it is um, it's, it's like Hinduism or, or how he was taught. They had a map you know, they had a map for this stuff. They had a map to, to remain in that state. Um, so that you, you didn't require psychedelics. And for so many people who are now interested in this stuff and, you know, maps do it. And, um, there's so many fantastic conversations out there. You know, they talk about how they're, they're these kind of little portals. And I think, and I'd love, I'd love your insight on this as well. You hear a lot about these, uh, gurus, you know, Terrence McKenna and Ram Dust and to name a few, um, that started out, you know, um, as psychonauts 
and eventually they just they they kind of just dispense with them and they they they, they just end up living a life of practicing meditation so it's it's it seems to be that you use these as tools or as you know alan watts says it's like you know uh, what does he say a scientist doesn't keep looking through the microscope you know once you get the message you got to put the phone away um yeah can, can you kind of can you talk on that yeah sure i mean yeah i mean i think uh you know, that that is a question and 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 interesting and and you don't want to make it too simplistic but it's you know on the one hand um are these substances and psychedelics something that can be ritually inter, ritually integrated into mm-hmm you know, your religious life, mm, mm. not necessarily your everyday life, but your spiritual practices. Is it a central part of what you do to maintain the order of the cosmos? Yeah. Or um, again, it's a simplistic way to make this contrast or, you know, is it you take it once or twice and you're, that's enough. You know, it's, yeah. you've seen it, you've done it. I think Bill Richards, William Richards, <laughs> Um, is one who talks in, in these terms. It's like life is transformed and you don't need, you know, it's not necessarily just the coming down and when are you going to get to the next one, but mm. that I've seen it, you know, I know something. Yes. <laughs> and my life is going to be different. Um, <laughs> we, we just watched in class today uh, something on um, PTSD with uh, Army uh, war veterans and ayahuasca you know, kind of, uh, uh, retreats and, you know, this, this is the way that these patients, soldiers, people, you know, explain what this experience means. Um, you, we don't, you know, obviously have long-term data yet on how things change in people's lives, but there's a real sense of boom transformation. It's not mm-hmm. like I need to keep coming back to this. But I've seen something that, uh, you know, is going to alter how I live now. Mm, mm. It's just a, a huge realization of I'm not what and who I thought I was. <laughs> That's gone. <laughs> yeah. And that can be something you want to kind of go back to and re-experience or see what else, you know, you can come up with. Or you may be like, hey, oh, well, that's enough. You know, yeah. I kind of learned some things. and. You know, but still, look to um, uh, in my uh, in my terms, I would still consider that the religious experience. You know, yes, it's something you have to keep coming back to or not, or is ritually integrated into your religious lives, mm. life, as I mentioned. Yeah. So, so yeah, if we can move back into religion, then, um, and I, I just I'd love to hear about your journey again as well. Um, you know, psychedelics were obviously a, a major um, proponent and then a uh, relationship as well, because Viktor Frankl spoke about that as well, how to find meaning. It's, it's all, you, you can, you can find that through love and transcendence. So that's, that's interesting. Oh man. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to date myself, but you're bringing up all my undergraduate books, you know, yeah. Frankl for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, certainly I, I, I would say love and, but there are other things too, to get outside of drugs and psychedelics mm, and mm. and if you want to keep it personal as well and i i do mention this in this little memoir but also i you know there was a particular dream that i had that i was so um uh, you know um insane and powerful and profound it's so and vivid that i you know, obviously i'm still li- living with it and, and the aftermath of it and it's one you know basically where i die wow yeah and kind wow. of get on some other side of things. And, it, you know, it's just like I was, I must have been 18 or 19. I mean, I wasn't, um, this wasn't the other day taking my senior nap. Yes. Uh, which <laughs> I don't do. Uh, but, you know, yeah. I was just young and who knows how stoned I was or whatever I was doing. But it was, it was just a dream that was like, uh, we know what dreams can do too, mm. you know, and um, I don't discount them at all. So mm. I, I felt a certain kind of power from that. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. I've, I've, uh, uh, I keep a dream journal and, um, it's massively changed my life, you know, looking at, uh, you know, different experiences and relating that back to traumatic experiences, but then even having a bizarre 
bizarre dreams. You know, I, I had one where I was on my deathbed and I kind of was dying with my family around and I went into this realm that was very similar to psychedelic realm. But then I had this incredible wave of fear and it pulled me back into my body. And I suppose that, you know, it was maybe drawing a long bow, I suppose, but um, I took from that, you know, just a spiritual idea that fear is what separates, you know, cause I was going back into that oneness. Um, right. But it was the fear that pulled me back into separateness. Um, but uh, you know, for people out there that uh, I, I love to talk about dreams and it's uh, even just the statistic that 80% more or less of PTSD sufferers suffer from reoccurring nightmares, in my opinion, automatically eradicates the idea that they're arbitrary because there's something right. going on there, you know? Um, it's, uh, yeah, do, do dreams come up a lot? I mean, I imagine they would because there's so many similar, you can get so much uh, wisdom from them, I suppose. Well, I hate to, but to be, to, to be honest, I, I hate to say it. I've moved away from dreams. Oh, so interesting. Interesting. I don't, I, you know, I, to be, I, it's making me think, I mean, I really don't even talk about dreams too much in my classes um, and don't uh, really bring them in, in terms of my writing or where, where my focus is. But that's again, because of a, a shift for me more toward the social and the cultural as opposed mm. to, um, you know, where I'm coming from in terms of my own journey, which is again, this sort of psychology groundwork yes. um, as an, you know, as an undergraduate. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, well, let's speak to that then. So the, the, the social and the cultural aspects, um, let's talk about sexuality then for an example, how does sexuality um, come into your, uh, your classes in terms of the social and the cultural? Cause obviously it's a, it's a, it's a um, important topic right now in the world as well. Yeah, well, and uh, religions have a lot to say. So I <laughs> <They> do, do. <laughs> you know, I tie it into um, the, these broader cultural patterns around these topics, which uh, for, for, for me, and I, I think are pretty obviously for anyone, um, tie to issues of our, our, the body and our mm -hmm. bodies mm -hmm. and questions around control of our bodies yeah. and how we are more materially and physically sort of constrained by, um, you know, certain ways of thinking, um, uh, that are tied to religion often. Mm. So, um, I, you know, my courses, we definitely do the sort of what, you know, kind of different Islamic perspectives, Christian perspectives, Jewish perspectives, um, native American perspectives, um, as I said, in ways that aren't too, um, you know, too uh, in depth, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but we can still think and across cultures and um, look at the ways in which ideas about sexuality are tied to larger questions of morality and uh, certainly issues around, um, as mentioned before, gender. Um, you know, it's tied into so much your own sort of gender identities and so on that uh, once you get the outside of what students are more familiar with, and I, I certainly would say these days they're familiar with a quite a range of different um, aspects of sexuality than mm. when I started, mm. you know, 20, whatever, 25 years ago in the classroom, I haven't been teaching this class that long, <laughs> uh, but, Still, I mean, it's a very different population or a sort of audience in some ways. And I think they're uh, more sophisticated mm. and, and aware of diversity than yeah. earlier generations. Are there many differences with how sexuality is taught in uh, the Judeo-Christian traditions or is it more or less the same? Uh, well, again, it's very different. It depends, you know, where, where you're coming from, um, with an evangelical tradition that's more focused on maybe, or these days around notions of purity and, mm. um, at least a very public sense of, uh, uh, you know, kind of heterosexual, more, uh, male focused, uh, uh, the areas mm -hmm. around the topic, um, or whether you're talking about, um, you know, Unitarians who have a much more liberal view of, of 
uh, sexuality and thinking about monogamy or thinking about, um, you, you know, anything, abortion, yeah. uh, various things. Same mm-hmm. thing within Judaism. I mean, for me, one one way I like to just carve it up is to think not so much Jewish Christian, but monotheistic oh, and, yeah. then, and then non-monotheistic yes. where you really can see uh, what it means to have one God as opposed to have a religious culture that's based on um, uh, some uh, more than just one God. Yeah. In yeah. In those terms. I've always enjoyed the uh, psychological uh, take on on the Greek religions and traditions of, you know, all these different gods almost representing the many emotions that seem to control us when they, you know, there was a, a god, I don't know the names, but god, it was, it was the anger. And it's, it's, it's almost like when you, when you listen to these ideas, it's like we've, we've projected our own consciousness out into the night sky to try to make sense of what's going on in here. And you see all that up there and it's like, oh, this guy was very angry. And this, and you know, you take a step back and you go, well, this is what happens to me when I get really angry. It feels like you know, I've got a lightning bolt and I want to throw it at everyone. And it, that sure. trying to understand our own psyche is, uh, you know, it's one of the coolest things I think human beings do is we put ourselves externally to try to figure ourselves out. You know, why is right. art so important? It's us painting, us journaling. It's us trying to make sense of ourselves. And I think the issue is when we get lost in the external projection, thinking that that's the reality as opposed to reminding us that it, it's, it's, it's a mirror of what's going on in here, but it's not necessarily correct. It's a way of us trying to figure it out, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean that, uh, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And I think as a kind of, if, if I may, pedagogical value to think in those terms, like it is, um, for me, I guess, I, I don't know if this is where you were going or what mm-hmm. you were thinking, but it's tied to myth and mythology, mm-hmm. not just, I mean, including things like Greek mythology, but also Star Wars. Yes. Uh, what are the current myths that really help us to figure ourselves out and to think about how, um, well, uh, 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 from my perspective, how really contemporary popular culture really does serve the same purposes as more traditional religious mythology has served in, in the past in other cultures. Yeah. So, so popular culture in, in a lot of ways is providing us with the myths that we do use to work out and make sense of our world. Um, but that you're, as you're saying, you know, is tied to uh, obviously some, uh, some more um, interior re- realities and questions and struggles mm. um, than, than, you know, than we often uh, can, can express. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have to think, uh, you know, you look at, uh, with everything going on in the world right now and then just how popular Marvel movies have become, you know, like I've just like, what's going on there? Why, why is as a culture, are we so fascinated with the hero? We've always been fascinated by the hero. As you said, Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, we've all got a Luke Skywalker in us, but unfortunately, um, we also need to recognize that there's also a Darth Vader in us, that good people that sold you into an idea of, the line that divides us is in- internal. Well, well, you're getting very young, Ian, and uh, yes, sorry, I, I got <laughs> psychology. So <laughs> I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I do. I hear also the echo of some of a, of a of a famous American poet, transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau, who talked about how most. Again, I don't know what the exact quote is, but most men, most people live lives of quiet desperation. So, Mm -hmm. you know, even as we like to think there might be this more heroic aspect of our lives, man, you know, most of our lives are lives are pretty drab, drabby and dreary and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just just getting through the day is a struggle. Um, Mm -hmm. So what do these projections mean? What do, what do these identifications mean? I, I mean, I think that's where you do get into some deeper psychological issues for people, but also there's the collective unconscious where yeah, yeah. this is also about society in America and thinking about uh, more, well, at least from my perspective, I guess, um, you know, it's, it seems very much about an American sensibility mm, mm. that gets tied into our psyche. You know, as well. 
Yeah, that, that but, is, but that maybe is really you know point. again, there's the global aspect of that 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 I'm obviously, um, you know, both uh, I'm hedging on. You know, it's like I'm an American who sees this sees this as a, as a scholar within a particular area, but here we are uh, talking about the you know kind of on a more global scale. Yeah, well, it's. I mean, there are. I suppose there are two ideas that um, came to mind when you were when you were saying that is. Um, it's it's trying to reconcile uh, personal issues with also social issues, you know. And we all like the idea of hero saving the day and all that kind of stuff, and who we could be and all that. And I think that helps deal with our existentiality. But then th- there are other issues, social, systemic issues, political issues that uh, are more community based, and that's that's equally important. And I think in 2020, not just in America, but across the whole world, I think those issues really came to the forefront. And that kind of speaks to your idea about the collective ego, the collective unconscious of all these things that I suppose have been suppressed for so long and now spilling out. And, and, and we all need to, as a community, reconcile. Right. Well, and that, uh, well, without getting too much into, you know, our recent history, but may, that may be tied to the pandemic as well. Just, yeah. Yeah. Well, for whatever reasons, obviously, that are very much tied to um, a very clear, obvious systemic uh, racism, other kinds of policing issues mm. um, that that are very clear and obvious, um, but that also just the whole social, global world conditions around the pandemic um, and the number of, of death, yeah. you know, the number of dead. The, the form of mass death that we have seen connected with the pandemic um, is something uh, that we we probably haven't fully dealt with, but that has had some consequences like bringing up from the uh, recesses of the unconscious, the collective unconscious, some, you know, some of these um, uh, up until recently not really addressed issues around yeah around these social problems and, and these existential questions. Mm. I mean, certainly it's, I've it's just, I've seen a lot of interest in a kind of public effort to talk more about death and we're, you know, death is, I never th- have ever thought of death as being taboo in terms of my own sort of research, but death is always on our minds and on our tongues and everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, but certainly with the pandemic, uh, you know, a kind of, man, we need to talk as you're saying, you know, we're all on the same page and we're yeah. all kind of in the same, no one gets out of here alive. Uh, <laughs> or as uh, Jim Morrison said, or someone said, yes. uh, right. And so what does that do for our humanity and our sense of empathy and, you know, kind of trying to, f- to deal with the short time that we have here. Mm. Yeah. So how, take us through kind of the, the subject is it death and dying. What, what's kind of like the intro class? How, how do you tackle it? Uh, you know, there too, I, I just um, pretend it's all intellectual, you know, and try to get them to think about, uh, you know, get students and myself, you know, to kind of be entering into this with the sense of um, what we're talking about. Everyone's dealing with it. It's a universal, unavoidable, inevitable aspect of, of what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. Um, And so without going too much into it, I mean, I also obviously tie that into, in some sense, the origins of religion or thinking, Mm. you know, what is religion? Well, when death occurs, religion is happening in some form, (laughs) you know, it's death calls out for religious response for what you refer to as meaning making, but that, you know, is, is it some kind of deep part of our, of our, of our shared human history? Yeah. What are we going to do about death? And then, you know, and then what I have written about, what do we do with that body, with the corpse? Yeah. Um, so it's a different set of questions uh, for sure. When you think um, about how that challenges people's sense of identity and um, people's emotional capacities and people's sense of the spiritual possibilities around death. 
Yeah, I, I got a lot from um, Ramdas, <laughs> obviously, and um, his whole idea about becoming nobody and the, the way he kind of spoke about, it, you know, when I was 30, you know, I was a somebody, I had a good job, I had the money, I had the car, I was psychology, I was a somebody, but there was this thing in me that I just couldn't get over, you know, and the way he talks about, and, and he did a lot of work with um, people who were dying, he, you know, there was a great part that he wrote about when he was sitting with his mum from memory and at that time, and you like to think that it's changed a lot, but um, at that time when uh, his mum said to him, you know, I, I think I'm going to die. And he just looked at her and he said, I think you are too. And, and, and she, he, I think he said something like she was so reassured by the fact that I was being real with her because everyone titters around and be like, Oh no, you'll be fine. Or like we pretend that it's not real when it's the most fundamental aspects of, of living. And, and I would argue, and I'm, I'm sure you'd agree as well that the, the sooner we really take a firm grasp and acceptance of death, that's the day that we really start to live because it's kind of a, it works like a paradox. Yeah. Well, and again, I would say this is what all religion is based on. Mm. Mm. Yeah. How do you, how do you integrate death into life? And um, for many, it's not, um, uh, that they're the opposites, you know, you know, death is a part of life, you know, it's, it's not like it's some separate category. And so religions are brought to life because of uh, that fact and our, our mortality. Uh, but I, you know, there too, I think it's more than just um, what do the Christians say and what do the Buddhists say and what do the Hindus say? Yes. Yes. Even I would, I, you know, I've, I've tried to write about and I've, you know, you, you could, I've tried to teach about whatever the notion that even science and our, our, our modern understanding of medicine and biomedical culture has religious elements and how, you know, how you, they think about death is tied into uh, sacred values, kind of moral systems, different kinds of rituals different mythologies, you know, uh, but that, that is tied into for, for the rise of biomedicine, this like no fucking way, you know, yeah. death is the enemy. We're going to do everything we can to, yeah. to, to fight it. And, and so that um, seeps into larger, you know, our larger culture that has been so much of part of the 20th century, but that has changed so dramatically in the last few decades. Um, but you know, you got, like, uh, my point is that the religious side of this is much more than I, I think many people tend to, uh, assume. Yeah. Did you feel it's because people have an issue with the word religion? Yeah, totally. I think that like, I think I've been saying this recently, but uh, there should be, we should come up with a new language to get yeah. to what we're talking about. Religion in itself is very loaded. It's political. I mean, the whole etymology of the word and, mm. you know, th this is a word that you don't find in other languages, you know? So what does that mean for our conceptualization of this part of human life? So religion, spirituality, you know, I kind of got hooked on, hooked on the sacred. So I like sacred as a, as a way into thinking That's cool. about transcendence, ultimate concerns, kind of social and personal identity, um, morality, those kinds of things. Mm, mm. I'd, I'd love to hear a podcast with you and um, Richard Dawkins. That would be fascinating. It's just hard hey, well, objectivist. <laughs> man, I just read some uh, not very good article about those new atheists and some of yeah. the trouble they've gotten into and um, oh, interesting. The, the crowd they've, they've hung around with. So I've, um, I, I'm, you know, it was fine, but you know, they keep coming up. Yes. Yes. Obviously. And I, you know, I, my, I, you know, I guess you would guess my position, which is what gets me in a lot of trouble, but that those, you know, there, that I would say to put it this way, that atheists are still religious. Yeah. Agree. You know, totally. I mean, relig being religious is a part of what it means to be human and mm. atheists don't like that idea. Mm again it's like how do you define religion yep. what do you mean by that term seem to um present as fundamentalists you know in, in, in any kind of whether you're talking about islamic or christian or whatever um so i try to be softer and i'm o i'm open man i don't know you know there's all kinds of things going on that we're just not gonna figure out and yeah I yeah, well, sit with that yeah. and live with that 
it's, it's that thing of, uh, you know, I can't be an atheist if I can be, if I'm, you know, uh, if I'm religious, but it's not, it's not one or the other. You know, I think when we're talking within our context, we're talking from, from the, the, the meta component of this, you know, we're talking about stories. At the end of the day, science is just another story. It came from religion. <laughs> we were talking about ways to view the world and how that, you know, I, there's a beautiful quote, funnily enough, to give credit where credit's due, that was by Richard Dawkins who said, um, you know, hardline atheist, objectivist, but he, he was writing about how wonderful it is to be human knowing that, you know, we're the lucky ones, I think it's called, you know, we're the lucky ones because we do get to die because we had the chance to see all this very, mm. very religious yeah. ideas. I mean, there. Yeah. I dig that. I mean, sure. Completely. Yeah. Uh, what, how, 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 how broad can you stretch that category religion? Um, people also don't like the term spiritual. So mm. there's another uh, scientist, a woman by the name of Ursula Goodenough. Okay. Her name, her, and her book is called The Sacred Depths of Nature. Mm. I don't think it got a lot of attention and it's probably the nineties or something, but it's, you know, she was a well-known cell biologist and hardcore scientist, but she yeah. wanted to identify her position in religious terms, talking mm. about a kind of religious naturalism where it's a reverence for evolution. You know, it's a kind of being inspired by nature in, in ways that she understood in religious terms and, you don't often get that, but I think it gets to the ways, you know, we can't really continue to believe we can just separate out science from religion or medicine from religion or health. Yes. It's all, you know, they're, uh, they're all tied together in way in really interesting ways, which is why I'm like, feel lucky for what I get to do. <laughs> yeah. It made me think of, <laughs> made me think of a quote, um, uh, something that Bill Maher said, I can't remember the name of that documentary, uh, but he did a documentary about, well, he's well, religi- what is it? Religious? Re- yes. Um, yes. That's um, it. Yeah. Religious yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But he, he was speaking, he was speaking to a priest. I think he says, he says, now you're a priest, but you're also a scientist. Now to me, that sounds like they don't go together like gay Republican. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Bill Maher, but that's yeah. Bill Maher. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so as much, you know, as we're t- taught or trained or programmed to think about these dichotomies, it's, that's, right. uh, that's what I love to do is fuck that up, get yes. students really confused about that. Totally. And um, just say, man, it's messy and yeah, there's no not going to no, escape yes. from this stuff. There's no correct. There's no, yeah, I, I, I try to just get away from, as soon as I start to think, oh, that's right, I'm like, oh, hang on. I've got to, I've got to move away from that. Like what is, cause there's so, I mean, there's, there's well, so many different perspectives, you know? Well, uh, yes. Uh, but, and then also some that I know that I stay away from that's, uh, you know, that, uh, more harmful or intolerant and things like that. But of course, of course, you know, that's another, maybe another episode. Yeah. Oh, we'll definitely do a round two. If you, if you'd like to come on, that'd be fantastic. I've just got a final question for you, Gary. You said that, um, death and dying, you know, and religion, at the base level, it's how do we integrate death into life? And uh, I was wondering if you could speak on how you've managed to do that. I, uh, I'm i working on it. You know, <laughs> I still am, even though I live with it uh, as a very much part of my life uh, because it's part of my uh, professional life, even though I'm, you know, uh, what, you know what, what, what I do, I don't see as work in any conventional sense. So in that sense, it's it. my professional life is my life. And so death is dominant Mm. Mm. as a, um, you know, topic because I'm teaching it or because I'm thinking about writing about it or because of the fact that so many of the people, you know, I know, uh, have, have been dying or, you know, the experiences with death that increase as you get older. Yeah. Um, so one of those I write, I just wrote about, but I, I won't, uh, I'll, 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 I'll mention it um, because it's so fresh, but, you know, I just finished teaching death and dying this um, spring. And while I was finishing teaching death and dying, my dad died. Mm. So uh, I, I the, you can find this on Sacred Matters. I wrote about it, um, so, and I think it was called um, 
my dad died while I was teaching death and dying. Wow. Wow. So it was pretty heavy and talk about yeah. integration and the ways in which these weird convergences can, can really be quite startling. But, um, wow. you know, because of the pandemic, I was able to go and be with him. He, he was fortunate enough to have home hospice. Mm. So I was there for the month, a month and a half as his cancer spread and got much worse and was with him as he again got worse deteriorated and died and i continued to teach death and dying wow so it, you know this, this it was a few days of overlap but it was like some of the topics were end of life care palliative care hospice so i'm sitting there on the screen at my dad's house while he's in you know in bed and we've got morphine action happening and it's all um getting close to the end and uh i don't know if i fully process that but you know again i liked writing about it i think yes. that one for me was therapeutic if not yes. religious if not religious but um it's just one story among many and um when you get to the i mean losing people through your life uh, is, is, you know, we're all going to face that. But mm -hmm. when you start to lose your parents and, and then, you know, fortunately my dad was 92, so he lived a really long life, but, you know, still it's a very, uh, uh, whatever, profound, powerful uh, experience that mm -hmm. here too, I don't think we talk about it enough. You know, yeah. no one prepares you for what's, you know, what may be ahead. And so, um, I, I don't know, but I think I may have more to write about it. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, it made me think of, there's a psychologist, I think he's a social psychologist at university of Texas called James Pennebaker. And he, his whole work was in expressive writing and how that is like a cathartic experience that can, that the statistics and the studies that he did show that students were far less likely to seek uh, medical assistance if they'd written about their traumatic experiences. Have you, have you looked into his stuff at all or? His, his name sounds familiar for sure, um, but I can see that. Yes. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Writing, uh, uh, obviously, for some people, it's great. Others, not so much. But it's it's been a yeah kind of um, up until this point, it's it's been key. Mm. Uh, and the other thing I'll mention too about my dad at ninety two as he's dying was and and uh, speaks to a lot about him. But he knows who I am, you know, and what I'm been into mm -hmm. so he was asking at this stage at this point of his, in, his, in his life whether he should try some mushrooms interesting and whether i could get him some and i was faced with this dilemma you know it's like but it was a dilemma for a second you know i never <laughs> thought i would give my dad at 92 his first trip <laughs> yeah. but it, it, it brings us back to that mm. kind of connection where um, i actually do and then you have written or had people on your show who've talked about the ways in which psychedelic experiences might like religion mm -hmm. help us deal with death you know in ways that are are, are so deeply rooted and uh, as we keep coming back to uh, what it means to be human in some sense yeah well i mean as you said i was just going to say as well um Marg Ross, you know, um, she's doing the first clinical trials in Australia here um, of psilocybin with her palliative care patients. And, you know, and we speak every now and then um, outside of the podcast as well. And, uh, you know, some of the results and, you know, these people have just, because what could be more gripping than having to face it, knowing that it's coming soon, you know, it's all happening for all of us. Um, but it, it feels, you know, at least in my experience, I always feel quite separate from it. You know, but when when you grip with with cancer and terminal illness, um, that death anxiety for for those types of people, you know, in those moments, and then psilocybin, I, I just I can't help but feel so excited about the where where the world's going, and um, you know, if you ever wanted to, I could speak to her, and you know, you could. Uh, have a comment. She's incredibly busy, of course. Oh, good. Well, but yeah, maybe we can have the three of us on. That'd be so cool. I was just thinking. I love that. that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with you on that too. I'm feeling really yeah, great with all of this, um, really exciting developments around the yeah. potential, um, that, um, these substances may have for people. Mm. Now, Gary, I mean, I'd, I'd love to chat for you <laughs> for the rest of the day, but obviously we can't do that. We'll have to do a, have to round two if, you, if you're open to it, mate. But um, 
where where can people find you? Did you mention a website before? Was it Sacred Matters? Sure, you can certainly just get to me at GaryLatterman.com. So G A R Y L A D E R M A N dot com. But then I'm, you know, whatever. Just Google search me. You'll find various things. Yes. Um, and yeah, that's 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 the, the best way to go about it, I think. Great. And is your writing up there as well? Because I'd love to read that um piece you did about um your dad that you mentioned just before. Yeah, yeah, that and, and there and also uh, on this um, magazine website on religion called Sacred Matters. So sacredmattersmagazine.com. Oh, right. Okay, cool. But both places uh, you'll find um, you'll find some of this writing and and also that Joe Rogan uh, pro- yes. uh, uh, podcast video uh, that I that I keep getting uh, responses from, even though yeah. now it's been months, uh, months ago. Oh, biggest podcast in the world, mate. That's a, that's a pretty good effort for, you must be doing something right. <laughs> oh man. I, yeah, that's a whole other, I wrote about that as well, but you can find that on the yeah, site cool. too. Cool. Oh, well, yeah. And um, I'll, I'll say one thing as well. There's a guy, uh, Brian Muriscaru. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. Um, that, that his, his work is absolutely fascinating as well. So it all ties into what we're talking about. Hey, A lot happening and definitely a lot to, uh, I think, look forward to in, mm-hmm. in, in terms of religion, in terms of psychedelics, drugs, in terms of thinking about a uh, new language to understand our religious and spiritual lives. Mm-hmm. You know? So, mm-hmm. so you're a big part of it too, man. <laughs> I, well, that's, that's very kind of you. It's, uh, I can't quite seem to get away from these topics, you know, talking about other well, things, but it all seems to come back to these ones for me. So, well, it's good that we connected too. And I'm glad we were able to. Yeah, absolutely. Gary, mate, thank you so much. Thanks for helping me going back and forth and finding the right time slot, mate. I really appreciate that. Hey, uh, look, and I'm, I really enjoyed this and I, I would love to do again. So yeah. anytime. Definitely. Definitely guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening and uh, I'll talk to you next week. Bye.